Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Leahy. I work out of Jefferson City, Missouri for the Missouri Department of Conservation as a natural community ecologist. And today we're going to have a, a tour of Missouri's natural area system and learn about why it's important and take a kind of a virtual tour throughout the state of these different gems. Um, the Missouri Natural Areas Program has been an interagency program since the mid-1970s. And it helps to conserve and protect and restore the state's best remaining natural communities from swamps to church glades. And the system has also been instrumental in developing new restoration techniques that we'll talk about later that are taken for granted today. So while our designated natural areas make up just 2% or less than 0.2%, I should say, of Missouri's lands and waters, 18% of all our plant species of conservation concern records that are tracked in the Missouri Natural Heritage Database occur in these special places. So in this presentation, we'll learn about how and why these natural areas are a key component to conserving the native biodiversity in our state. And the logo of the natural area system is the jack in the pulpit. This drawing is by the uh, legendary wildlife artist, Charlie Schwartz, who was uh, an early member of the natural areas committee. And this adorns all of our natural area signs as well as publications. But before we delve into the details of um, designated natural areas, let's set the stage and talk about some of the, the outstanding biological diversity we have here in Missouri. So even though we only cover about 2% of the US, we rank 21st in the nation in terms of our native species diversity with over 2000 different native plant species and over 180 different native fishes. And a lot of these species we know very little about. Um, you know, some species like deer and turkey, uh, largemouth bass, we know quite a bit about their life histories, but a lot of other species we know very little about. And so the best way that conservation biologists have come up with to conserve all these different species is to manage their habitats or their natural communities that they depend on for survival. So natural communities is a a term that is used to define a, a specific type of natural habitat in Missouri. And these are definable groups of plants, animals, and their physical environment that's been least negatively impacted by modern society. And we have some great references that over the last 46 years, the Natural Areas Program has helped to develop to define what our different terrestrial and aquatic natural communities are and then to conduct inventories of these different sites and recommend areas for both purchase and designation. And the Missouri Natural Areas Program has also been instrumental in developing um, techniques for restoration and management. So the hallmarks of a natural community that we try to conserve in our different natural areas include intact soil, so unplowed soils are a key component of our natural communities and our natural areas. Lots of different habitat specialist species. So for instance, this Coreopsis bee um, feeds on the pollen of just prairie Coreopsis, that one particular plant species. Different ecological processes, whether it's fire or flooding, it's another hallmark of a natural community. And these areas just have a large amount of uh, different life forms and different interactions, such as pollination. Natural communities are where habitat specialist species thrive. Now, these areas do include habitat generalist species shown up here. Um, but these things you can find in all sorts of areas in Missouri. So common ragweed, white-tailed deer. I have those in my backyard in Jefferson City on occasion. And overhead, I get Canada goose flying from urban ponds. But I don't get all these species on the bottom. Um, these are the habitat specialist species that we try to conserve on our natural areas. That includes many different orchid species, um, rare or declining insect species such as the regal fritillary, and other interesting species like the northern crawfish frog and Niangua darter. So now let's take a tour of the main community types or habitat types that we conserve on our natural areas in Missouri. So we have a wide variety of these different community types, including prairies, um, and this being a Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, of course, uh, we realize how 
how rare and special these remnant prairies are. We also try to conserve tall grass prairie savannas, such as this one at Union Ridge Conservation Area called Spring Creek Ranch Natural Area. And MPF is going to be leading a guided hike um, this coming Saturday, actually, at Union Ridge Conservation Area um, from around 9 a.m. through uh, about 3 p.m. And we'll have more information on that at the end of the webinar. But this is the scene that you can see if you, uh, if you do go on that field trip this weekend, we'll have a be able to see something just like this. We also have woodlands, natural communities on our national area, such as at Peck Ranch Conservation Area, where we have Steagle Mountain. We have uh, true forests, and these include places like Engelman Woods Natural Area. Glades, those rocky outcrops in the Ozarks that support many different wildflower and reptile species. And we have wetland natural areas, such as Oliver Lake and the Missouri's lowlands of Southeast Missouri. A number of natural areas feature stream natural communities, such as the Little Niagara River, which supports the Niagara darter, which is a, a federally listed species. It's this colorful fish in the lower right corner. And this fish only occurs in the Missouri Ozarks of Missouri, nowhere else in the world. So we're conserving this species entire range here in our state. And we have a number of uh, cave natural areas since Missouri is one of the top cave states in the country, um, the top three, we have over 5,000 caves um, documented in Missouri. And some of these are designated natural areas. So the natural areas program in the Midwest began with Aldo Leopold actually in Wisconsin. And the work of Aldo Leopold and others in Wisconsin led to the creation of the first state natural areas program in 1951 in Wisconsin. And master conservationist Bill Crawford, who is one of the founding members of the Missouri Prairie Foundation, along with Don Christensen, photoed here as a younger man. He has now passed away. Um, he went on a uh, trip to a conference with the Midwest Wildlife Society meeting in Wisconsin in, the, uh, in 1970. And came back with the idea to start a natural areas program here with the conservation department. So the conservation department's natural areas program began in the early 1970s and was a key uh, component of the design for conservation, which was the program that um, started the conservation sales tax that we have here in Missouri. And as part of that um, promise of design for conservation, the department promised the citizens of Missouri that with some of that money from the conservation sales tax that it would be used to purchase lands for new natural area designations. And that occurred. So a good example of this is Paintbrush Prairie Natural Area south of Sedalia, which was partly purchased with conservation sales tax funds, specifically um, because it was going to become a designated Missouri natural area. And there are a number of other uh, purchases that followed after that. Now, in 1977, the MDC or Conservation Department Natural Area Program expanded into a partnership with Missouri State Parks and the Department of Natural Resources. And after that, a number of other agencies and organizations joined the Interagency Committee for the Missouri Natural Areas Program. That includes the Mark Twain National Forest, the Ozark National Scenic Riverways, the Nature Conservancy, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so this committee, uh, made up of members of all these different organizations, has the authority to recommend areas for natural area nomination or delisting. And our designated natural areas are vetted by a rigorous review process by this committee, as well as external efforts, and are approved by agency policies. So these are kind of our highest, best remaining remnant natural communities on these public lands and privately owned lands by foundations such as the Prairie Foundation, uh, the Ladd Foundation, and the Nature Conservancy. Today, we have 140, excuse me, 194 natural areas in 77 counties shown in the, um, the little green stars on this map. And these cover uh, the total acreage is 102,000 acres, which is just 0.2% of our state's lands and waters. As you can see, 
a lot of our natural areas are uh, down in the lower southeast Ozarks where we have a lot of intact landscapes, but they are spread throughout the state. Within Missouri's comprehensive conservation strategy developed by the Conservation Department as well as, well as other conservation partners, you'll see that all of our priority geographies, which are in red, contain at least one or more natural areas. And then our conservation opportunity areas in orange, 65% um, of natural areas fall within this conservation opportunity area network. The reason for this, and it's not coincidental, is that our natural areas contain a disproportionate share of our natural heritage resources. And so this further reinforces the importance of these focal landscapes that the Conservation Department, along with its conservation partners, are working on to maintain native biological diversity in the state. So designated natural areas have many values for conserving biological diversity, as well as outdoor recreational values and scientific values. Many of these are very highly biologically diverse sites. So let's take a tour of what that means. For example, the Missouri Prairie Foundation's La Petite Gem Prairie Natural Area, while only 37 acres, supports an incredible 335 native plant species. And this diversity occurs at a really fine scale. So the area of a quarter square meter, about the size of the chair you're sitting on, um, <clears throat> There was a plot that was surveyed by some expert botanists at La Petite Gem Prairie about the size of that quarter square meter, and they found 38 native plant species, which is outstanding. At Little Niagara River Natural Area in Camden County, fisheries biologists have documented eight darter species, two of which are only found in Missouri, including, like I mentioned earlier, the Niagara River darter. And a natural area in the Ozarks, just under 100 acres in size, supports over 25 reptile and amphibian species, which is a high diversity <clears throat> of these creatures on such a small area. At Overcup Fen Natural Area in Ripley County, nearly 20 dragonfly and damselfly species occur, including this one, the federally listed Heinz Emerald Dragonfly. At larger scales, some natural areas, such as the Sunklands Natural Area, can serve a wide diversity of natural community types. So this is an aerial photo of the Sunklands Natural Area, which is north and west of Eminence, Missouri, in Shannon County. And in the slide, you can kind of see a general upland forest, but also in the middle of this is a giant sinkhole basin that has um, a sinkhole pond marsh and a variety of other sinkhole communities. This large natural area supports over 20 different natural community types from dry desert-like glades to these marshes um, in the middle of the basin. <clears throat> so, although our natural areas comprise a small proportion of our state's land mass, they support populations of 40% of our species of conservation concern, which is a high number given that small, small land mass. And population, <clears throat> populations of half of the number of our federally listed species in Missouri, such as the Topeka shiner fish shown here, um, occur on our designated natural areas. And 18% of all plant species of conservation concern occurrences in the whole state occur on natural areas, which make up just 0.2% of our land mass. So again, these are very, very diverse areas, very special areas in the state. Now, 4% of conservation part of lands are designated natural areas. However, these account for populations of two thirds of the species of conservation concern they're tracked on Missouri Department of Conservation lands. So again, 
for us in the conservation department, these are real hotspots of native biological diversity. Now, one of the things that we've learned over the past 46 years of the National Areas Program is that a lot of our national communities require more than just um, protection. So you can't just buy a prairie or a glade and walk away because it will turn into a non-diverse uh, cedar or brush thicket. And so a lot of our fire adapted natural communities or flood adapted natural communities require some kind of active management. This can include um, thinning, thinning, sorry, <laughs> thinning eastern red cedar trees on glades, prescribed fire of all different grassland types. And in today's landscape, um, we often need to control um, deer populations that are often um, overabundant and non-native invasive plant species are found on, on nearly all natural areas. And so those often need control too. So back in the 1970s, when the program first started, um, a lot of times folks thought, well, they could just buy the land and, and the job was done. But today we, we understand that that's usually just the first step in an ongoing maintenance and restoration of our natural communities on our natural areas. Some of the first, well, actually the first glade restoration project um, that occurred in Missouri occurred at Caney Mountain Natural Area, which is on Caney Mountain Conservation Area. And Caney Mountain is an interesting area. It was purchased by the Conservation Department back in the 1940s as a wild turkey refuge. And one of all the Leopold's sons, Starker Leopold, actually did his graduate work on that native turkey population there. Um, and he stayed in a cabin that was on the conservation area, which is still there today, which is kind of a neat place to visit. Um, and then the work based on his work with the turkey population was used um, to reintroduce turkeys uh, and maintain their habitat throughout the state. One of those tools that they looked at um, <clears throat> in the 70s and 80s was restoring glade areas for turkey broodering habitat. So here we see a cedar encroached glade um, before treatment. Cedars were cut. There was a first prescribed burn, then a second prescribed burn. And of course, after years of a prescribed fire and ongoing cedar thinning, um, we have the Caney Mountain natural area of more recent years, which is one of our outstanding natural areas in the state, which is a mix of glades, forests, woodlands, caves and springs. And some of the first prairie burns um, occurred on, on Missouri natural areas. Tom Tony, who is um, the Missouri Department of Conservation's prairie biologist and worked closely with Missouri Prairie Foundation, um, did some of the first burns on prairies in the late 70s and early 80s on natural areas such as Osage Prairie. Prior to that, um, the prairies were just maintained via haying. The first uh, conservation department woodland burns occurred at Steagall Mountain Natural Area at Peck Ranch. And this slide uh, series shows um, the before and after eight prescribed burns in 24 years. And you can see how the native plant diversity and cover decidedly increased with the restoration work on this natural area. However, at the time, burning in the woods was co quite controversial with conservation department foresters. So over time, a lot of these different management techniques that today we often take for granted um, were new and novel at the time. And a lot of that work came out of the Natural Areas Program. So here's that same scene. If you go back and pay attention to this tree here in the middle, you'll see it's still there in that photo 24 years later. And you can see the difference in this woodland community that's been restored. Same with this photo, again, 24 years earlier, and more recently. Another thing that scientists found out with the rest restoration of the glades and woodlands at Steagall Mountain Natural Area, this was work that was done by Alan Templeton from Washington University in St. Louis. They found that after the burning began 
burning across the landscape, which was again controversial at the time, burning the woodlands and glades. The eastern collared lizard population, this really charismatic reptile here, exponentially the population and its inhabitants of the glades exponentially increased after they began that uh, landscape level burn of a woodland glade complex. And again, this was um, in the late 90s, this was a very controversial management technique, but the science bore out that it was really important to restore these uh, rare lizards. And of course, we're learning more and more about how natural areas, such as Golden Prairie Natural Area that the Prairie Foundation owns, are important for pollinators. So, for example, Golden Prairie, um, which is also a national natural landmark, supports 45 different native bee species, of which 17 are considered pollen specialists, such as the blue sage bee shown here, um, coming to get some pollen or nectar from, uh, I mean, pollen, sorry, not nectar from a, a blue sage bloom. The first conservation department prairie reconstructions, which are now becoming more commonplace on both conservation department lands as well as others, um, occurred at Helton Prairie Natural Area, shown here. And at Helton Prairie, um, basically what we did is we collected seed and hayed the remnant prairie and then spread that hay and seed on the adjacent crop ground over time to re reconstruct that prairie. But that was one of the first, well, the first ones that <clears throat> the department did. And we continue to rely upon remnant prairies, particularly some of our remnant prairie natural areas to provide seed for reconstruction projects, both on conservation department lands, as well as other private lands and other agency lands. So these natural areas are, besides being reservoirs of, of native biodiversity, they're extremely important as reservoirs for native seed and native ecotypes. There are also anchor points for our priority geography. So for example, um, shown here is the Missouri River Hills priority geography, which is, um, basically lies between uh, Fulton, Missouri and Warrington, Missouri, south of Interstate 70 and the rugged river hills before the Missouri River. Um, two natural areas, one at Daniel Boone Conservation Area and one at Danville, are really the strongholds for both seed sources for restoration in this geography, as well as um, models of natural communities that we're trying to restore on both other private and public lands in this geography. Missouri Department of Conservation Lands are also um, certified by the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, and our natural areas um, are a component of that certification. So they help us in, in reaching this uh, certification, which is uh, an important uh, aspect of our, our forestry program. Because of all these reasons, um, within the conservation department, our natural areas are considered in the top tier, or tier one of our, of our approach to habitat management. Now these larger red blobs here, those are the priority geographies, but then the smaller red areas are the natural areas. And then of course you can't see since it's all red, the natural areas within these priority geographies um, are masked by the, the duplicate color, but our natural areas are in the same priority as these priority geographies. What we'll do now is we'll take a, a neat tour and take a look at some different natural areas across the state. Um, we'll start in the Springfield Plateau, north and of Springfield, Missouri. And here we see a 25 mile prairie natural area, which is a conservation department natural area. And this is a remnant prairie which in it of itself is very rare, but this remnant prairie is um, on soils that are from limestone and weathered from limestone, which is even more rare because most of these limestone prairies have been plowed for agriculture since the, the soils are, are very fertile. So this particular natural area features many interesting calcium loving plants such as prairie turnip and prairie iris, 
and supports as well a good population of the uh, regal fritillary butterfly, a species of conservation concern. Now moving to the Western Ozarks, we have Haha ha Tonka Woodland Natural Area, which conserves a wide variety of Ozark natural communities from caves and springs to glades and even a mesic forest in a sinkhole basin. This area was instrumental in introducing the concept of woodland prescribed fires. The first woodland prescribed fire trials in Missouri were conducted here by state park staff in 1983. Since then, in all those years of restoration, this has become one of the premier spots in the state to see both woodland and glade natural communities. And 492 plant species have been documented on the nearly 3,000 acre natural area seen here. <clears throat> the area also contains glades, such as in this photo, and many interesting old growth cedars, um, such as one shown here. Now we'll move down to the lower Ozarks near Ava, Missouri. And here we see Ava Glades Natural Area on the Mark Twain National Forest. This contains the largest dolomite glades in Missouri. So these are shallow soil grasslands. Some have called them Zara grasslands. And down there, the glades are very large. They cover whole ridge tops. The glades there even include north and east facing slopes, which is unusual. Um, a very interesting landscape there along the Glade Top Trail of the Mark Twain National Forest. And these include a number of species with more southwestern affinities, such as the Greater Roadrunner and uh, Stenosiphon, a plant shown here, which is a species of conservation concern. But again, this species is more common to the south and west of Missouri. Now we move to the Lower Ozarks, and opposite of the desert-like conditions of Ava Glades, we find Greer Spring Natural Area, which is the second largest spring in Missouri, discharging around 200 million gallons of water a day with a mile-long spring branch before entering the 11 Point River. Now, Greer Spring is now owned by the Mark Twain National Forest, but it has an interesting history. It was privately owned for many, many years until the early 90s and was put up for sale when the family uh, ownership changed hands. And thankfully for us, Leo Dry, who was the founder of Pioneer Forest um, and who has since passed away, he was able to purchase Greer Spring. And then later, um, the Forest Service was able to acquire it from Pioneer Forest, Leo Dry, um, and was able to protect this really fascinating and wonderful place. This is my favorite spring in Missouri. It's very undeveloped. Um, you have to hike in to get to the spring, and um, it features just a, a really neat cave entrance where the spring comes out, and then a second large boiling water spring in the middle of the spring branch, so a very unique place. And this supports um, over a dozen species of conservation concern that depend on these, uh, well, depends on this cool microenvironment that we see here. <clears throat> now moving up into the ancient mountains of Missouri, the St. Francis Mountains, we have the St. Francis Mountains Natural Area. So this natural area lies in the land that's owned by both state parks and the Conservation Department in between Johnson Shutton State Park and Tom Sock Mountain State Park. And these are the remnants of an ancient mountain chain that's 1.5 billion year old rock that's volcanic. And here we find these interesting glades on the rock type known as rhyolite that are very diverse, some of the most uh, diverse rhyolite glades in Missouri. And these support, in one particular location, um, the best population of Meads milkweed, the federally listed Meads milkweed in Missouri, um, occurs on these glades. It also occurs on prairies in western Missouri, but ironically, the best population of this species in Missouri occurs <clears throat> on this natural area in the Ozarks. Now, unfortunately, feral hogs, introduced feral hogs, have been a tremendous threat to this natural area and the meat's milkweed on it. But thankfully, due to ongoing and sustained efforts at feral hog control through the Interagency Missouri Feral Hog Elimination Partnership, the feral hog numbers are starting to come down, um, but it's still a threat in this area. Now we move to a completely different environment 
in the Mississippi Lowlands of Missouri, which is basically the northernmost extension of the Mississippi River Delta that runs all the way from New Orleans all the way up to south of Cape Girardeau. And here we find the mysterious waters of Wolf Bayou. This slough is home to a number of fish species that are at the northern edge of their range that are more common to the south. And this includes things such as the cypress minnow and the flyer. It's also home to this guy, the alligator snapping turtle, which uh, sits in the water and uses its worm-like tongue as a lure to uh, lure in fish that it eats. And it's able to stay underwater for uh, pretty amazing amounts of time. And these things can live up to about 50 years old. So truly amazing creatures uh, at this wolf bayou. Moving farther to the north on the edge of the Ozarks, we have Hickory Canyons Natural Area, which is owned by the LAD Foundation and Pioneer Forest, but managed by the Conservation Department. This is on Lamont Sandstone and features many, many different types of ferns, mosses, and liverworts. So, Mosses and liverworts are considered non-vascular plants. <clears throat> and this particular natural area supports 150 different species of these mosses and liverworts, which is, makes it, it's in the top three in Missouri in terms of the density of those species. Moving underground, we have some different natural areas that are caves. So Mossy Spring Cave is one that uh, includes a half mile cave passage which, and a cave stream. Now this particular cave um, was not very well known about. And so it's uh, cave formations shown in the picture here on the right, such as these um, stalactites and stalagmites are in very good shape. They were not, there was not much vandalism. This cave is now gated with a, a bat friendly and airflow friendly gate to keep uh, potential vandals out. Um, <clears throat> and yet allow animals and water to move in and out through the cave entrance. Moving into the River Hills, we have Weldon Spring Hollow, which is not that far outside of the St. Louis metropolitan area in the steep River Hills of St. Charles County. And here we have some tremendously large trees and a, a, a wonderful uh, spring wildflower display of uh, trilliums and ferns. These trees are really big. The conservation department employee in this picture next to this bitternut hickory is six foot five. So he's a big guy and that's a big tree, which they have a lot of at the Weldon Spring Hollow natural area. Moving up into the north part of Missouri, the glaciated plains, we have Lowry Marsh, which is a native remnant marsh. The uh, iris, the native blue flag iris you see here growing amongst the bulrushes and smartweeds um, is, is not that common and uh, requires a, a decent marsh community to grow. This particular marsh um, supports six plant species of conservation concern and a population of the northern leopard frog, which the northern leopard frog is common in Iowa and to the north, but it, it, its southern edge of its range is here down in North Missouri. Unfortunately, the hydrology of the marsh has been impacted by ditching and drainage on adjacent lands to the east, so it doesn't get as much water as it used to. And unfortunately, all of our marshes in Missouri um, have been impacted to some degree by changing in flood regimes or drainage projects. So this one is, is less impacted than most and is a, a real prize gem um, since so few marshes uh, remain in Missouri. <clears throat> Moving to the far northwest corner of the state, up in Atchison County, we have some really steep bluffs above the Missouri River floodplain. Here we find lust soil, which is windblown soil that was deposited after the last glaciation. And these lust soils are on very steep slopes that face west. And so they're very arid conditions. And what this does is supports a prairie community that's more common 100 miles to the west of Missouri. So this is more of a mixed grass and short grass prairie disjunct growing here in Missouri. This includes um, Western species that the next place you can find them is 100 miles to the west in Kansas, Nebraska, such as loco weed, 
shown here and a uh, soap tree or let's see, I guess it's soap, soap weed, not soap tree, soap weed yucca. Then moving into the Osage Plains of Missouri, um, we have the single, the largest single prairie remnant left in Missouri is found at Prairie State Park on Regal Prairie Natural Area. And this 3,500 acre prairie supports over a dozen species of conservation concern. And it's a very good place to see Northern Harriers and shorter, short ear owls in the winter time. And it just has a really interesting landscape perspective. Um, one of the few places in Missouri where you can see a, a very large prairie remnant, as you can see here. And just to reiterate, the Natural Areas Program is made up of many different partners. Some are on the Natural Areas Committee and others aren't. So we have Natural Areas at Mingo, National Wildlife Refuge on the Mark Twain National Forest, on the Prairie Foundation lands, of course, and on LAD Foundation and Pioneer Forest lands. Natural areas are often uh, important sites for scientific studies, especially to research rare and imperiled species, and also to establish um, what are the benchmarks and baseline conditions for natural communities that we want to restore on more degraded sites. And most natural areas, except for cave natural areas, are open to the public. And so depending on the agency or organization that owns the natural area, different outdoor pursuits are allowed. So on conservation department lands, many of our natural areas are open to hunting and fishing, um, which is different than state park natural areas. But all natural areas are open to foot traffic, bird watching, uh, nature photography, and nature study. And they make great destinations for um, master naturalists and other outdoor education destinations. Now, if you want to learn more about our natural area system and go visit it, um, a good place to start is just to Google Missouri Natural Areas, which will take you to the natural areas page on the Missouri Department of Conservation's website. And here, um, there is a map that has Missouri counties and locations of the natural areas, as well as an alphabetical listing of the natural areas by county. And you can click on those and find out um, information about the different natural areas, what to expect, um, what features are protected on the site, and driving directions. We also have um, a natural areas brochure that is available at nature centers, and you can purchase a guidebook to um, some of the, the neatest natural areas in the state. And these are available um, at Missouri Department of Conservation nature centers, as well as our online nature store. So what does the future hold for our natural area system? So it's been around for 46 years. And so we, you know, we have uh, made good on the promise of conserving a lot of different natural community types. We recently uh, finished a gap analysis of our terrestrial natural communities conserved in a dozen na natural areas and are just in the process of doing an aquatic natural areas, I mean, natural communities gap analysis to see which community types are represented and which aren't represented on the natural area system. And so with, with that knowledge, we can go ahead and, and look at different community types that we need to either acquire or restore um, to complete the natural area system. Of course, the work of a natural area managers is, is um, ongoing because we have the constant threat of invasive non-native species, as well as invasive native species like Eastern red cedar, um, some areas suffer from public overuse, <clears throat> and we have ongoing uh, land conversion and habitat fragmentation um, in the landscape around some of our natural areas. So there's a, a need for, for ongoing restoration and management. And so just to reiterate, the goal of the program is to inventory, protect, manage, and restore 
high quality natural communities and geologic features for public benefit through the system of dedicated Missouri natural areas. And so, you know, we encourage folks to become a supporter of natural areas and, and advocate to them by letting natural area managers and agency administrators know that you value and appreciate them and visit some of these sites and become uh, acquainted with them and then let other folks know um, of your appreciation of the system. Of course, lots of good photographers out there helped with this uh, presentation. And then at this point, I'll open it up to, to questions and then let's see uh, what we have in the chat. All right, thank you so much, Mike. Um, I've been to some of these areas, but I have a lot more to, to visit still. Um, we do have a few questions coming in. Uh, I did wanna just quickly mention again that you will be hosting a hike at Union Ridge Conservation Area this Saturday. And I believe that's from 10 to three and that's near Kirksville. What can people expect to see on that tour? So we'll see all sorts of different um, tall grass, prairie and savanna species. We should probably be able to see uh, blooming cream gentian, which is more of a North Missouri species. Lots of different um, sunflowers and asters and goldenrods in bloom. Lots of, uh, we'll probably see some monarchs, lots of other insects. Um, we might see some migrating birds if we're lucky. Um, there's warblers moving through as well as um, sparrows and wrens. Um, and then they'll kind of have some nice, basically looks of kind of a tall grass savanna landscape, really nice um, overviews of uh, a really scenic landscape. And of course the native warm season grasses right now are, are very scenic as well. So, um, in a nutshell, that's that'll be what we'll be seeing. Great, thank you. Um, we did have a question from Jack, and and I was wondering uh, also, since you have so much experience with these natural areas, um, do you have a favorite that is close to uh, St. Louis? There's a oh gosh, it's hard to <laughs> <laughs> narrow it down. Huh? Close to St. Louis, I would say. Um, Labar Creek Natural Area um, would be a favorite, and that Labar Creek Natural Area can be accessed two ways. One is through Labar Creek Conservation Area, which is on the, I have to remember right, north side, includes the north side and natural. The natural area is shared by Missouri Department of Conservation and Missouri State Park. So there's a Don Robinson State Park that the natural area is on to the south. And then the natural area also occurs on LaVar Creek Conservation Area to the north. And they both have hiking trails. And, and so those those are really neat um, natural areas that are, you can really feel kind of a sense of wild right there, not, not far outside of St. Louis. It's Jefferson County, but it's the very north end of Jefferson County, Missouri. So it's close to most, most of St. Louis. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Karen, and I can see some of these, like I could see like Karen Cox said, how far is a hike into Greer yeah. Spring? Yeah. I think it's a two miles in and two miles back or one and a half mile. It's not very far. Um, it's not, not too terribly far. And it's, it's kind of a gradual downhill and then a gradual uphill <laughs> on the way back. But it's a very well done trail. It's a very very good trail. I wonder um, if these are all marked. Are they marked or do you just have to know about them? The, all the, the, the ones we've covered so far are all marked. Okay. Now, some of them, the ones in, you know, if you look at the information on the, the natural areas directory online, um, it'll tell you, you know, if there's, a, you know, established trail or if it's just here it is, it's, some areas don't have, you know, it's just a parking lot and that's it. And others have, you know, hiking trails, but they're all marked with the natural area sign. <clears throat> um, 
in Camden County, the, the best place to share with the natural area would be the one at Hahatanka State Park, which is outstanding. And I, the number of natural areas has been um, slowly increasing, but, you know, we're kind of coming to a plateau because there's not, <laughs> we're not making a lot of new natural areas out there. Um, but uh, fortunately, we haven't had, we have had to delist some natural areas that were destroyed by um, excessive sedimentation and wetland um, issues that, you know, beyond our control. But fortunately, that hasn't been, most natural areas that were designated have stayed natural areas. And then yes, Highway 6, we learned, is closed west of Kirksville, and we have alternate directions. If you sign up for the hike, um, Haley has provided all the residents with the new directions on how to get to, to Union Ridge. In terms of drought, um, if you Google the uh, US drought monitor, <clears throat> you can see a great map that shows you all the counties in Missouri and what their um, drought status is. And, and definitely, yeah, there's a band from Kansas City all the way here to Jefferson City through central Missouri that um, is very dry. The Ozarks south of Springfield, Missouri, there's a band that's been pretty average um, in precipitation. So not everywhere in the state is in drought, which is good. Um, how much revenue does the tax support the natural areas? I would have to do research on that. Um, the conservation sales tax helps to pay for some of our work on natural areas on conservation department lands, but then on natural areas that are on forest service land or state parks or prairie foundation lands that they have a different revenue source. And then near eminence, gosh, it's hard to pick a favorite near eminence. There's so many cool places um, around the eminence area. I would say Steagall Mountain Natural Area on Peck Ranch would be a great place. That also includes, that natural area is a very large one. So it includes the mountaintop um, that you can visit and you can actually walk up a fire tower to get a, a panoramic view of, of the Ozarks and the glades where the collar lizards are. But then Rocky Falls, which is owned by the National Park Service um, is also included in that natural area. And so that's a separate place, but the same natural area. But Steagall Mountain Natural Area would be my first pick near Eminence. Um, Blue Spring Natural Area would be another second pick. Um, Alley Spring Natural Area would be up there. That's would be, <laughs> the list goes on. There's several. And then if you want a really remote natural area, Sunkland's Natural Area is north and west of Eminence. It's a big one. It's I think it's about three thousand acres, but um, that's a very remote area that you really have to have uh, good orienteering skills and and map and compass to and <clears throat> to to explore. But those other areas have all developed trails. Um, Great. And. Let's see. I think we had another question come through the chat. Um, what terrestrial systems are underrepresented, do you think? So we don't have a um, a natural area uh, that um, represents our sand prairies or sand savannas. <laughs> and so that's one that we're looking at possibly um, since the Prairie Foundation's recently purchased two sand prairie savanna areas, there's that. And there's also a, a sand prairie um, remnant in Northeast Missouri um, on a Frost Island Conservation Area that we're also looking at. But those sand communities have been underrepresented in terms of uh, terrestrial community types, as well as um, marshes and fens, some of those wetland types. All right, thank you so much. I think I'm just quickly going back through and I think that I've I've gotten to, we've gotten through all of those questions. So that's great. Uh, and so at this time, I think we'll go ahead and wrap things up. I uh, really appreciate Mike uh, 
you taking the time to share this information on natural areas. We have a lot of places to discover still, right? <laughs> so oh, yeah. I, For sure. I hope everyone is able to get out, out and, and check out some of these great places. Um, as mentioned before, the webinar will be is being recorded and the email will be sent to you tomorrow with the webinar link and other helpful resources. And if you enjoyed this presentation, we hope that you will join us for our next Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar on September 27th. It is Take a Virtual Hike on the Prairie Fall Edition with Bruce Schutte. So again, thank you all so much for joining us and for to Mike for his great presentation. And I hope you all have a great evening. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.